to worship here at St. Martin's Lutheran Church, whether you are with us in person or joining us online, it is good to be with you. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Uh, several announcements to share with you this morning. Uh, you may have uh, noticed a, an email or a Facebook post uh, regarding masks. The council has not yet met. We'll be meeting on Tuesday. But in light of our uh, county judge raising the COVID threat level back to orange, uh, Harris County back up to red with the spread of the Delta variant, it seems at this time uh, wise to consider wearing masks. We do have some extras for those who don't have one with you who would like to wear a mask. Uh, at this time, much of the guidance is saying vaccinated or not, it is a good thing to be considering wearing a mask to help stop the spread. Uh, if you have questions or concerns about masking or about the vaccine, I'd be happy to speak with you uh, throughout the week and uh, hear your concerns and share what I know. It's not a lot, but I'm happy to share what I've got. Uh, we can do this and we can do this together, but I, uh, I ask your consideration as we face uh, rising numbers once again. Uh, today, we are excited to have the opportunity to have a, a back to school pool party at uh, the Mura's house. Uh, I don't see Monica here at the moment. Um, Renee, anything you can share with us on Monica's behalf? There she is. Thank you, Monica, for y'all's hospitality yeah. and uh, hope to see lots of our young people there as we celebrate the return to school. I know all of our young people are excited about going back to school. I heard a no, but I'm going to pretend I didn't. Um, some weeks ago, we shared that our brother in Christ, Walter Leake, had died in Christ. Uh, we had been waiting until family could come in from out of town to have his memorial service. Uh, that I can now share that service has been scheduled for this coming Saturday, August the 14th, 11 a.m. Um, all are welcome to come as we lift our brother Walter in memory and celebrate both his life and his resurrection. We are a resurrection people. We give thanks for the gift of abundant and eternal life that we have in Christ. Another upcoming date, uh, the Saturday following, August 21st, we're having a little shindig here. I don't know if anyone heard about it. Um, Julie and I will be getting married uh, here at uh, St. Martin's. Thank you. We're excited, too. Um, August 21st, the service will be at 4 p.m. Uh, we did send something out through the constant contact this week. Because of limited resources, we are asking that uh, the reception following be limited to our, our family and friends coming in uh, from other places. But I'm happy to share with you that as, we, as we've been discussing our Rooted in Hope for September, uh, our first week is hospitality and mutual ministry thought, what could be more hospitable than celebrating the wedding together? So we'll have an opportunity for the church to have a bit of a reception as well on September 5th. We'd love for you all to be there uh, to celebrate with us. And we will kick off our September rooted in hope, hospitality, outreach, praise, and education. Uh, more information will be coming about our September fun, but I can share with you that on the 5th, there will be a bounce house and some raffles. We're going to have a good old time as we come back to uh, the start of the year, both for the school and for the church. I think that's everything I've got. So I invite you to rise as you're able. And we will continue with confession. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. I invite you to sit or kneel as you are able.
God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways. They differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able for our gathering hymn, Hymn 658, O Jesus, Joy of Loving Hearts.
gracious God, your blessed Son came down from heaven to be the true bread that gives life to the world. Give us this bread always. He may live in us and we in him, and that strengthened by this food, we may live as his body in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to be seated. At this time, we'll continue our children's sermon series. I invite our children to sit in the front row or close to as we talk to our young and young at heart about worship. Good morning, children of God. Good morning. I have a question for you. Have any of you, children of any age, ever gone out and gotten your boots or shoes muddy yeah. and then walked back into the house and tracked mud? Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of agreement there. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And you know, even before you said anything, mom or dad, they always knew, didn't they? They could tell. We have eyes in the backs of our heads. We have a sixth sense. We know when mud has been tracked into our house. And lying, I don't know if anyone's ever said, it wasn't me, it was little brother, little sister, it was the dog. Did that work? No? No one tried? I found that in any situation, whether it's dirty shoes or broken lamps or whatever else it is, lying only makes it worse, right? Because mom and dad, they know. We know what's going on. And so lying just adds one more thing to get in trouble over. Telling the truth lets us try to fix it. You know, God knows even better than our parents do when we've messed something up. The Bible calls that sin, when we do something or say something that's not obedient to God. And in worship, we come in every week and we start with confession. Remember, we confessed our sins just a few minutes ago. And confession is when we take time to tell the truth about how we've messed up in big ways and little ways throughout our week. We tell the truth to God because God already knows but the Bible tells us something really great. That when we tell the truth to God about how we've messed up, God always promises to forgive us. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to wait and see how God's going to feel. God always promises to forgive us. We call that absolution. We start our worship services with confession and absolution, telling the truth and hearing our forgiveness. And we start that way for two reasons. Number one, because we don't want to track mud in God's house. We don't want to bring our dirty shoes and leave our tracks all over the place. We want to have clean hands and clean hearts when we come into God's house. But also when we tell the truth about the ways that we mess up from day to day, from week to week, and when we hear that we've been forgiven, then we're ready to do what we can to help fix it the next time. So let's pray together. Will you pray with me? Dear God, Dear God thank, you for promising thank you for promising to always forgive us. Always forgive us. Help us confess when we're wrong us and forgive others when they wrong us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thanks so much, everybody. We'll continue with our first reading. A reading from the fourth and fifth chapters of the book of Ephesians, beginning with the 25th verse. So then, putting away falsehood, let us, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. Let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, <coughs> forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Here ends the reading. We'll read Psalm 34, 1 through 8. The congregation will read the bolded verses. I will bless the Lord at all times. Praise, Praise of God, God shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the lowly hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt God's name together. I sought the Lord who answered me. And delivered me from all my terrors. Look upon the Lord and be radiant. Let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction, and the Lord heard me. And saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord. And delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who take refuge in God. to St. John, the sixth chapter. Lord, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the Father who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I invite you to be seated. Grace and peace be to you from God our Creator and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, as many of you know, I grew up in the church. Every Sunday, my butt was in a pew, whether I wanted to be there or not, because if I was actually sick enough to warrant staying home, then I was probably dying and therefore needed a pastor. 
My church was big on memory work, and every week my Sunday school teachers would quiz us on our verses. I was a pretty serious student in confirmation, and we had a public examination in front of the congregation. Some of you did that as well. 200 questions. Many of them came back around to me. By the time I graduated high school, I had a pretty decent grasp of scripture, a more than passable understanding of the Reformation and the Lutheran Church. I had memorized the liturgy, I knew most of the hymns in four-part harmony, and I knew my catechism backwards and forwards. All that to say, folks, I was a pretty good Lutheran. And most everybody knew on some level that I was going to end up being a pastor one day. So I will tell you, friends, that it came as a bit of a shock to me when I went to college and discovered that for all I knew about being a Lutheran, I wasn't entirely sure I was a Christian. You see, I knew a lot of facts. I could quote a lot of scripture. I even understood a little theology. And all of that was very good. Don't misunderstand me. I am deeply thankful for the foundations that my parents and my church laid in my life for faith. But for all of that intellectual understanding, I had never encountered Christ. I had never experienced grace. And in my freshman year of college, I had a crisis of faith. Because for the first time in my life, I found myself unable to reconcile all the things I thought I knew about God with the world that was crashing down around me. It was the first time, beloved. Let me assure you, it was not the last. A little knowledge can be a dangerous thing. By and large, we humans like to think that we have it together, perhaps, more than we really do. We want to see ourselves as more competent than we sometimes are. We want to believe that we are really quite clever and have figured it all out. And there's this temptation, I don't know if you've experienced this, but I know I have, that when we come across new information or a new experience, sometimes we want to dismiss it in favor of what we know or think we know, because learning is hard. Growing is painful. Vulnerability is uncomfortable, and it is so much easier to just believe that we've been right all along. We all want to be the hero of our own story, and it's hard to admit that maybe we don't understand like we thought we did. It hurts to own our brokenness. That seems to be part of the struggle the crowds are dealing with in our gospel reading this morning. A couple of weeks ago, we read about how Jesus fed 5,000 hungry people with a couple small fish and a few barley loaves. And then last week, the crowds tracked Jesus down across the lake, and he began to teach them, and they asked him for a sign. Jesus tells them that miraculous feeding they experienced was itself a sign. And what it points to is that Jesus is the bread of life who feeds and sustains us. This week, we, we begin exactly where we left off, a controversial, seemingly heretical statement, I am the bread of life. Jesus goes on to say that he has come down from heaven to do the will of his Father, so that any who come to him might not be lost. And the crowds begin to grumble. They take issue with these things that Jesus is saying. And at least in this week's reading, it seems that part of the problem is they know just enough to be dangerous. They know the scriptures, they know the laws, they know the histories, but more than that, they know Jesus and his family. What does he mean, the will of his father? Isn't that the carpenter's kid? The crowds know Jesus, or think they do. And what they think they know prevents them from really hearing and accepting what Jesus is teaching. Make no mistake, friends, it is a hard teaching. And frankly, it isn't going to get any easier. As Jesus continues this discourse, the crowds will become increasingly offended to the point that many of them will turn back from following. These things that Jesus is saying, they don't make sense. 
They don't fit in with what the crowds already know. And if the truth were known, folks, the same thing that challenged these crowds 2,000 years ago sometimes challenges me. Sometimes faith doesn't make sense. And there's a part of me that knows that that's sort of the point. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I know that if I could truly understand all these things, I wouldn't need to have faith. But church, am I the only one who wishes that sometimes it would just make a little more sense? Sometimes it would be just a little easier? But I'm reminded this morning that there is a difference between examining and encountering. That's why I didn't understand when I was younger. See, I treated the scriptures more like an answer key to a test than a love letter from a God who was still speaking outside the page. I treated Jesus like a wealthy relative who had died and left me an inheritance rather than a lover pursuing me no matter how many times I walked away. I treated faith like a problem to be fixed, but we don't fix faith. Beloved, faith fixes us. That's what Jesus is offering, church. Not just this morning, but every new day. Jesus promises eternal life to all who believe, and in John's gospel, whenever belief is discussed, it is less about intellectual affirmation than it is about a commitment to remain in relationship. Belief is not characterized by always being sure and feeling positive, but by active struggle to deepen our understanding. It is belief that led the crowd into the wilderness to sit at Jesus' feet. And the difference between those who turn back and those who remain is whether they have come to figure out Jesus or to find something they've been missing. Are they trying to make their faith fit in a nice little box or are they willing to let their faith fix what they cannot reconcile in themselves? For those who are seeking a king that will conform to their ideals and a faith that will fit their preconceptions, this Jesus does not hold much appeal. But for those who come seeking an encounter with a grace that is greater than their hurts, Jesus promises to feed them with the bread of life that is his own body. Throughout the scriptures, we hear of God's provision for those who struggle. God provides water for Hagar, and she has given up hope of saving her son Ishmael. God provides bread for David as he flees a murderous King Saul. God provides bread for Elijah when he is ready to succumb to his despair in the wilderness. God provides safety for Daniel when he is cast into the lion's den. Time and time again, we see the proof in the scriptures that when our strength runs out, God provides. When our faith runs out, God provides. As the Apostle Paul reminds us, God's power is made perfect in weakness. But my dear friends, it is not only in the pages of Scripture where we are meant to encounter God's abundant grace. We are meant to encounter the Christ in his body, the church. Paul says, be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us. We are meant to be a place and a people of encounter, a hospital for sinners rather than a museum for saints. We are meant to be a living testament to the one who loves us exactly as we are, without exception and without expectation. But for so many people, the church is an unsafe place. For so many people, the church is a place where their brokenness has been weaponized and their hurts have been magnified. For so many people, beloved. The church is a place where grace is explained, but never encountered. As a result, we find a whole lot of cultural Christians and not enough dedicated disciples. It's the same dis divide that was in the crowd in that wilderness. It is the same challenge that's faced in Ephesus and everywhere else Paul went. 
the cultural Christian picks and chooses those things in Scripture that fit their worldview and don't bother with the messy parts. The cultural Christian expects the church to give them what they want and be there when they need it. The cultural Christian looks at the brokenness of this world and thanks God for making them so clever as to have figured it all out and found Jesus. The cultural Christian reduces God to something made in an image we can comprehend and control. The cultural Christian, beloved, is what perpetuates the problem of church being an unsafe place and an unwelcoming people. By contrast, the dedicated disciple learns and grows as they return again and again to a living word that is both comforting and challenging. The dedicated disciple knows they are the church and they have an obligation to be that for others. The same gracious presence they have needed before and will need again. The dedicated disciple looks at the brokenness of this world and thanks God for the opportunity to help those walking the same dark valleys God has led us through. The dedicated disciple is an imitator of God, always seeking a deeper relationship with our Creator so that we can be a closer likeness in our living. Dear Church, this world needs more dedicated disciples. As we continue to live in the reality of this pandemic, we need more humility and less hubris, more patience and less pessimism, more grace and less grumbling, more compassion, less criticism. It is okay to not know what the next step is so long as we remember that we are on the road together. It is okay to have questions and concerns so long as we remember that those with whom we disagree are not our opponents but our partners. It is okay to be tired, to be frustrated, to be vulnerable, because when we are broken, faith fixes us. When our strength runs out, God always provides. What we need is here, beloved. A little bread. It isn't an answer so much as it is an invitation. We might come together as the body of Christ to receive this gift that sustains us in our weakness and that we might share our grief and our comfort, our faith and our struggle. I will admit it doesn't seem like much. Friends, we have seen before what Jesus can do with a little bit of bread. So let us share this meal and let us share the rope. May this bread sustain you on your journey and bring you to an encounter with the one who is pursuing you in love. And together, may we seek to be better imitators of Christ, our host and our meal. Amen. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able for our hymn of the day, hymn 488, Soul Adorn Yourself with Gladness.
church on earth, beloved, let us confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was blessed to see you by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Rooted in Christ and sustained by the Spirit, we offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all of creation. For the church of Christ in all its diverse forms, for mission developments, new mission starts, and all communities of faith exploring new models of ministry for the sake of the gospel, for congregations facing difficult decisions about their future. God, in your mercy. Yes. For the health and well-being of creation. For shade trees that provide refuge from the hot summer sun. For lakes, rivers, and oceans contaminated by pollution. And all who lack clean water. God, in your mercy. Yes. For those called to positions of authority in our legal system, we pray. For judges, lawyers, law clerks, and court employees who ensure the fair administration of justice. For corrections officers and prison chaplains that will, they hear and deal mercifully with those who are incarcerated. God, in your mercy. Your mercy is For all who cry out to you in their affliction, for exile, refugees, and others who face long and difficult journeys, uncertain about the future. For all who mourn the death of a loved one. For all who are sick, especially Michael, Anna Marie, Al, Jeff, Barbara, Jean, Mitzi, James, John, Don, Terry, Dave, Dawn, Millie, Mom, Don, Deborah, Sharon, Steve, Amy, Dean, Mike, Pat, Vita, Adriana, Joyce, Tracy, David, Bob, Suzanne, Brian. Irene, George, John, Mary, Warren, and all those we name before you now, aloud or in the silence of our hearts. God, in your mercy. In your mercy. For this assembly, gather around your table, we pray. For those among us who bake bread and prepare the table for the feast you give. For those who bring the food from this table to those who are homebound or hospitalized. God, in your mercy. Your mercy is great. For those who have been raised to eternal life, we give thanks. With all the saints, we praise you for the bread of life that keeps us in your love forever. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, We lift these and all our prayers to you, O oh God, confident in the promise of your saving love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
At this time, if you are worshiping along with us from home, we invite you to have bread and wine or crackers and juice with you. If you are here in person and did not receive one on the way in, there are communion packets located by the door. I invite you to take one now. I invite you to rise as you are able. The Lord be with you. saying, Take and eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you, for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. All are welcome at the Lord's table, beloved. You are what you eat. Come. Receive and become the body of Christ. I invite you to be seated. The body of Christ given for you and for me, beloved. Beloved, the blood of Christ shed for you, shed for me. Now may this body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace unto life everlasting. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're able for the benediction. Now, beloved, let us go forth in faith in our non-perishable God, who gives us daily what we need to feed our bodies and spirits. Our common need for nourishment unifies us together as the body of Christ. May the holy bread of life create sustenance for the journey 
calm for troubled stomachs, grace-filled movement for aching limbs, and joyful activity for all bodies as we seek to live in sacred community. Amen. Let us join our hearts and voices in our ascending song, hymn 860, I'm so glad Jesus lifted. beloved may you share that peace with everyone you meet in every way that you can go in peace serve the lord thanks be to god and we will Okay, thank you for letting me know. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll keep you up on what's going on. Okay, thank you. 